clients for loaning us their very tech savvy owl. Um, Just unmuting some people from the waiting room and then we'll be able to begin. Perfect, thank you. Dear Excellencies, dear participants, first of all, thank you for joining us both in person and virtually. It's exciting to see in front of me civil society representatives and representatives of member states together in the room prepare to discuss the cross-cutting agenda to protect people and planet. For those attending online, please do let us know in the chat box where you're joining from and who you represent so that we can learn more about you as well. To know online, you also have translation options in English, French, and Spanish for the duration of the event. Now I wish to thank the IOM and the UN Network on Migration for giving Caritas Internationalis and its co-sponsors, Mercy International Association, Act Alliance, and the NGO Committee on Migration, the opportunity to organize this official side event during the International Migration Review Forum. The Global Compact for Migration is the first time an international agreement mentions climate change and environmental degradation as main drivers of migration and calls on states to address their root causes and enhance legal protection of environmentally and climate-induced dis displaced people. With this side event, we wish to draw the attention to those structural drivers of today's migration, which is increasingly mixed and forced, and also to reflect on the legal protection gaps which still exist. Today, Caritas and its partners will provide stories of success in addressing the root causes and multiple drivers of migration in relation to GCM Objective 2, and will call for the expansion of safe, regular migration pathways in relation to GCM Objective 2. The Caritas Confederation especially welcomes that GCM Objective 2 and 5 have both been broadly supported by member states in the negotiation process of the Progress Declaration. However, we believe that symbolic commitment to addressing adverse drivers of migration must be followed by or translated into concrete actions, many of which CI and its partners stand ready to showcase at this side event in the afternoon ahead of you. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Aloysius John, the Secretary General of Caritas Internationalis. As you know, we are the Human Development Organization of the Catholic Church and a confederation with over 160 members working in over 200 countries and territories worldwide. Mr. Secretary General, Mr. John, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to all of you and good afternoon. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure for me to address uh, this uh, forum, Your Excellencies and dear participants. I would like to thank the IOM and the UN Network on Migration for giving Caritas Internationalis and its co-sponsors, Mercy International Association, ACT Alliance, and NGO Committee on Migration, the opportunity to organize this official side event during the International Migration Review Forum. Migration due to climate change and environmental degradation, and consequently, food insecurity and increasing poverty is a growing phenomena and that could become aggravated in the next years. For the first time, an international agreement, the Global Compa Compact for Migration, recognizes climate change and environmental degradation as main drivers of migration and calls on state to address the root causes and, in, and enhance legal protection of environmentally and climate-induced uh, climate displaced people. We are experiencing a global ecological crisis and Pope Francis in his encyclical letter, Laudato Si, 
calls us to respond through an ecological conversion. He writes, striving to overcome problems such as hunger and food insecurity, persistent social and economic distress, the degradation of ecosystems and the culture of waste calls for a renewed ethical vision. One that places the person at the center, desiring to leave no one on the margin of life. Conflict, ch climate change, natural disasters, increased vulnerability, poverty and food insecurity accentuated by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the current Ukrainian war to conflict today show the multidimensional character of this ecological crisis. The interconnectedness of these factors is key to understanding the complexity of migration and developing comprehensive policies to respond to the needs of the most vulnerable people. It's a matter of social transformation. It is a matter of social justice. Through its 162 members across the world, Caritas Internationalis encounters communities experiencing the impact of climate change on food, water, land, and services, which is affecting their livelihood. The dignity of vulnerable local and indigenous communities is at stake. Caritas is committed to reducing the vulnerability of local communities affected by climate change. This will require a two-pronged approach, taking action through financial means and legal means. Uh, and the second one is a legal means. Caritas Internationalis therefore calls on decision makers and political leaders to allocate, number one, allocate substantial funds to invest in projects that enable people to stay where they live and make migration a choice and not the necessity. By minimizing the adverse drivers and structural factors that compel people to leave their homes, the home country or country of origin, as stated by the objective two of the Global Compact for Migration. The second, a second approach is promulgate legal protection for, uh, for climate and climate related migrants through clear policies and concrete mechanisms to implement and monitor them. Consistency with the objective five of the Global Compact for Migration, which, which contains a call to make regular migration channels accessible and more flexible. With reference to the first call, the Caritas, International, Caritas experience of building community resilience to climate change is based on prevention and preparedness, strengthening disaster risk reduction through early warning systems and anticipatory actions, and capacity building by enhancing and valuing local leadership. In that framework, it would be very important to increase funding for family farming projects based on agroecology and local knowledge. It is also key to continue strengthening the link between humanitarian aid, development, and peace by investing in long-term strategies founded on social protection and cohesion. These elements are becoming a central part of our local Caritas work, as well as the mobilization of women and youth to develop adaptation strategies by combining traditional practices and innovative inputs and technology. We can witness good practices in Bangladesh where Caritas supports vulnerable female households who do not have access to water to join efforts into an association and strengthen their capacity by using local knowledge. In Papua New Guinea, where around 80% of the population is based in rural areas and climate induced vulnerability of the weather largely affects people's livelihood and long term sustainability. Caritas Papua New Guinea has engaged in, is, has engaged in disaster response and relief e efforts, as well as on prevention and preparedness. And in this way, Caritas contributes to strengthening community resilience to shift from reactive to proactive actions. With reference to the call on strengthening and developing further safe and regular pathways for migration, 
we see that climate induced displacement often occurs internally and remains within the competence of the local governments. However, an increasing, increasing number of climate displaced persons also cross border for safety due to sudden cyclic or slow onset hazards. Currently, they cannot rely on internationally legally binding instruments for their, for their protection, as there are often conditioned on criteria which climate displaced persons cannot meet. A special national and international protection status should therefore be granted to people and communities displaced due to climate change. Caritas encourages states to implement promptly and without discrimina discrimination the recommendation of the Global Compact for Migration to promote access to essential services for all migrants by taking into, con taking into account their vulnerable situation, particularly that of women, minors, and indigen indigenous people, and to not only welcome, but also measure to integrate and take measures to integrate them into the host countries. We also recommend strengthening measures to inform climate related migrants about their rights, risk, and the safe, safe and legal avenues available for them. Faith-based organizations can play an important role on this point, especially when, organizing, organ, when, when organizations operating in neighboring countries work in partnership to ensure safe pathways, clear pre-departure information, accompaniment during the journey, assistance, and support at their arrival. We have several examples of this from Thailand to Senegal. We consider this forum a unique opportunity to strengthen our common commitment, civil society organizations and states in addressing the multiple and interrelated factors of migration and in, and in filling the legal protection gaps. It is urgent to promulgate international legal protection by developing clear policies and ensuring necessary means to Im implement and monitor them. I wish you a fruitful moment of reflection and sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. John. And it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Mr. Paul. I know I asked for your last name's pronunciation and forgot to write it down, uh, but my best shot is Scott Silas, which is definitely wrong. It's fine, Scott We were We were almost there. Um, <laughs> the Deputy Director of the World Food Programs, UN System and Multilateral Engagement Division in New York has spent more than seven years in the field with World Food Program, leading large-scale humanitarian and development projects in Lebanon, the Gaza Strip, and the West Bank. He is also an advisor to the WFP Executive Director in Rome, but prior to joining the United Nations was a Special Assistant to the Under Secretary of State in Washington, where he shaped US policy and public diplomacy during the economic, energy, and food crises. For nearly four years, he was a staff member in the White House Office of Policy Development, launching a number of innovative economic development and anti-poverty initiatives. Throughout his career, he has been involved in G7 and G8 and G20 summits, the World Economic Forum, and the UN General Assembly meetings. He was also a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a Fulbright Scholar to Turkey, and has a BA and MA degrees from Georgetown University. Very, very well accomplished and so grateful for you to be here. I'm just going to move this to your side of the table and allow you to introduce our panel. Thank you, Brianna. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Mr. John, for those uh, excellent remarks to give us an overview of the situation and uh, migrants and placing people, particularly migrants, at the center. Um, we have a wonderful panel today. I want to give them a brief chance to introduce themselves. 
and then I'll do a quick introduction. We'll go straight to the panel and we look forward to an in engaging interactive Q&A session. So please do stay online and stay here uh, because we would like to hear from you and have uh, a Q&A discussion with the panelists uh, after, after I take them through a few questions. Um, let me start with Marius Zipwe from uh, Caritas Zimbabwe. Marius, could you briefly introduce yourself? Our technician and well, we have to unmute Marius. Hello, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you. It was unmute. Yeah. <laughs> it was muted. Yeah, my name is uh, Marius uh, ZB, the national coordinator for Caritas Zimbabwe, a member organization for Caritas Internationalists. Thank you. LV Monsat from um, Red Clamor. LV. Hi. Yo voy a hablar en español, así que bueno, espero poder tener la traducción. Yes. We have translation in the room, Mr. Albury. Thank you. Tenemos traducción, Elvi. Tenemos traducción. Puedes hablar en español. Gracias. Bueno, un saludo para, para todos y para todas. Un placer poder estar en este espacio. No sé si debo comenzar ya mi intervención. No, just a brief introduction, Elvi. Do yourself. Me informa, por favor. Elvi, hay traducción en, de español al inglés que puedes conectar tú para escuchar lo que el, lo que el moderador te habla. Si por favor puedes conectarte con, para, para poder escuchar lo que te pregunta. Dice que solamente ahora mmm, dos segundos para presentarte. ¿vale? Gracias. Bueno, yo soy Elvi Monsán, venezolano. Secretario Ejecutivo de la Red Latinoamericana y Caribeña de Migración, Refugio y Trata de Personas, que es la Red Clamor, y soy el Director Pastoral de Caritas Venezuela. Thank you, LV. And then we have Matei Letonen. Matei, Mati. Thank you, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation and I'm very glad to be in, in this panel. I am from UNEP, UN Environment Program, and so I work with climate issues and, and with the interface of climate change and, and peace and security here in New York. Great. And then Mr. Christian Wolf uh, from ACT Alliance. Yes, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Rolf. I am responsible for the work of ACT Alliance on migration and displacement, and I'm based uh, in our secretariat here in Geneva. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Christian. And our close, our, uh, we also be having Amparo Alonso. Uh, please. Hello, everyone. Para Alonso, Caritas Internacional is based in Rome at the Vatican City. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to give a little overview uh, before we take our, we go into the panel. Um, the Global Compact on Migration explicitly states that migration should never be an act of desperation. And we heard uh, Mr. John saying that we need to put people at the center. And we know that unfortunately, due to the climate crisis, um, 
it often is it's just a, 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 a situation of desperation to have to move. Let me give a couple of quick facts from the perspective of the World Food Program and the climate change. 80% of the world's extreme poor live in rural areas, and we know rural areas are often the first to be impacted. Rural livelihoods are often the first to be impacted by climate change. Migrants play an outsized role in, in uh, agriculture. All over the world is often um, either failure in food systems could lead to migration or lead to stresses that, that cause migration, but also migrants are the source of labor in so many farming communities around the world, here in the United States, but also in Europe and Latin America throughout internal migration, international migration patterns often follow agricultural livelihoods. We know that those livelihoods are at risk uh, to the climate change. If temperatures rise two degrees, we'll see an additional 189 million people who are in, in hunger. That would more than double what we have now. And if temperatures rise four degrees, so not two degrees, but four degrees, that will increase to a staggering 1.8 billion people who are food insecure. So that, that, that area between two and four is just astronomically a, really a, a crisis in terms of food security. And we know that food security is a critical driver of migration. Um, many of the migration patterns, here we are in New York City, how many people came to New York City because of a, a food crisis and where they lived before? Um, patterns of migration and immigration, patterns of refugee crisis often follow uh, food crises. We know, we did a recent study in, Latin, in Central America that found that food insecure households were three times more likely to migrate because of the situation. While these figures are troubling, it's also a significant opportunity to reinvigorate a focus on food security, like rural livelihoods, uh, urban livelihoods and food systems and to put migrants and people at the center of food systems. Food systems feed us they also provide. Uh, uh, they also provide nutrition, uh, biodiversity concerns can be addressed through food systems, and they also provide livelihoods. So, moving on to our panel, Marius, um, Caritas. Uh, Marius is from Caritas, Zimbabwe, and we're seeing some of the impacts in Zimbabwe right now of climate change. Uh, Marius, we saw in January there was the tropical storm Anna, who had a devastating uh, impact in Zimbabwe and led to a national emergency. And we are seeing more extreme weather patterns, uh, Mozambique, um, Zimbabwe, all through Indian Ocean, and of course here in, in our neighborhood in the Caribbean, uh, we're seeing storms. Can you tell us, Marius, uh, tell us about the storm, the impact that it had on the livelihoods in Zimbabwe, and what measures are you doing to mitigate those risks in health communities, uh, given that the, uh, the storm you have, but also more storms to come? Thank you very much. Um, let me take you back a bit uh, and also have just a small background on um, uh, climate change induced uh, disasters. For example, Zimbabwe has experienced drought, prolonged dry spells, floods, and cyclones. And of course, this has been worsened by the unprecedented COVID-19. Since 1983, we have experienced 22 droughts, eight of whom were very severe, affecting livelihoods, affecting food security. And food insecurity has risen actually from 12% to 60% during the last 10 years. And the rapid onset disasters uh, characterized by cyclones, tropical depressions, and, um, and uh, tropical storms are on the rise. Uh, in 1996, we had Elin, Elin 2000, Bonita 1996, Jaffet 2003, Idai 2019, Shalin 2020, Elois in 2021, and more recently, as you have referred to, the Anna in January 2022. And uh, what were the effects? Because there have been loss of livelihood and um, migration. People have left homeless. Uh, displacement is actually okay. 
uh, there's been a lot of reduced food, insecur- food security and livelihood and destruction of property. And of course, that has resulted in, um, in um, uh, some migration of some, some kind. Uh, for example, in 2015, 3,000 families were displaced during the Chokwe Mukosi uh, floods. Uh, in 2019, more than 200 people were killed uh, during the cyclone Idai, and 500 missed. Actually, 250,000 were impacted, and that has seen some people displaced. Let me also say, what are we doing at local level to make sure that um, we help in building, building climate resilient communities? First of all, we have programs of strengthening community disaster preparedness structures and systems in Zimbabwe. We are actually training uh, the civil protection unit at national level, provincial, district, and grassroots level, so that they uh, we build community managed disaster risk reduction committees and help them to develop plans uh, which they would implement. We are also uh, for those with houses that have been uh, destroyed, we are helping them develop durable plans and help them to um, build more durable structures so that they can resist some any kind of some kind of um, structures that uh, that may be destroyed. Carita Zimbabwe is very much into water harvesting infrastructure building. Throughout the country, we are building dams, weirs, and in some cases, installing drip irrigation so that um, vulnerable communities are found on the same piece of land producing land. They may not run away to seek for, for food. At the same time, as we work with the communities, we are also uh, established community management conservation teams. Um, and these teams actually, they help in tree planting and care, gully reclamation, conservation works and wetland protection. Most of our projects are actually food related and therefore we promote climate smart agricultural technologies that would include conservation agriculture. This has worked very well. Agroecology, green housing, small grain promotion, and the use of open pollinated seeds. We train farmers to multiply seed, save seed, and use indigenous seed systems. Um, and at the same time, integrating crop and animal production so that um, when crop fail, the communities are about something to lean on, either feed on animal product or sell animal product to get alternative food. As we train farmers, we also encourage them to have farmer-led research and innovations that has got a lot of indigenous knowledge systems within them. And by so doing, uh, it has been tested and tried for over years. So these are some of the projects which we do in, uh, in Zimbabwe, in the eight dioceses of the country that cover the whole uh, country. This has seen production improving. And um, as production improves, we've seen that what is needed more also is processing and value addition so that um, we link them to market so that they can get also funds that they cannot sell their assets in, in times of stress. So value addition is also very, very uh, critical to uh, our projects. Most of our projects, we encourage farmers and train them organic farming systems where they learn to use um, uh, cattle manure, where they learn also to use liquid manure, and also natural soil and fertility management to include natural pest and disease control. 
and that has seen farmers resisting some of the climate uh, change issues and producing more even in times of, of stress. Farmers are trained to have seed sovereignty by holding seed fairs and food fairs. The indigenous seed, like the small grain, is actually used. And you know, the indigenous seed is resistant to, um, uh, it's more resistant to climate uh, change induced drought, and it, it needs less feeding. And at the same time, it resists pest and disease control. And this has enabled farmers to at least harvest something even in the driest, driest seasons. You realize that, uh, as I have already mentioned, uh, we train farmers the ecological system where they grow OPV seed, use cattle manure, and the maize stove is taken back to, to animals. Animals produce dung. And that ecological system creates a low external input agriculture that is user-friendly even to the poor communities. I've mentioned about conservation agriculture, where it conserves almost conserves labor, it conserves uh, 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 it also conserves nutrients and even water. This is in support also of the government is actually uh, leading in that uh, that regard. Small grain, very often people have tended to grow maize always, but this is very prone to uh, diseases. It is prone to droughts. It is also prone to water stresses, but the small grain is actually um, proved uh, worth producing in our country, particularly the drier areas. And by so doing, most of our projects throughout the whole country, we promote small grain. And fortunately, the government is also um, uh, promoting that. So in most cases, our, our, our projects, we are always also in line with what is the government is also promoting. And um, by, by so doing, we work with government structures and um, government extension system, particularly in the community areas. And um, I've mentioned indigenous food systems where we promote indigenous food processing and value addition, world food fairs, and that will increase nutrition as well as bringing in money for, um, for the uh, vulnerable uh, communities. What recommendations do we, do we give as we implement uh, these um, projects? First of all, it is very important to strengthen the community-led DRR strategies, which already we are doing together with the, the government system. Ours is to capacitate the government system and the government system will also capacitate the communities. Number two is that uh, it is important to support smallholder farmers to produce their own food instead of just waiting for them to, to become recipient of food aid. And uh, as I've mentioned, it is also important to have a policy shift from conventional farming system that is expensive, that is more chemical, to a more agroecological, organic, non-synthetic system that has got low external input, affordable to even the vulnerable people. And um, we are having a shift. We have been giving people food, but now we are having a, sh a shift from mere food aid to food assets so that the vulnerable communities, they can actually produce assets which they can use in cases of um, uh, uh, emergencies. Yes, uh, John has already mentioned, much of our project, we engage women and youth, uh, women's role in food security uh, is not questionable. And youth are still very much energetic. But uh, for youth, we realize that they need to be linked to to markets because they need cash. So it is our role to link them to markets. And um, one of the issues we do in our projects is that we actually promote rural microfinancing. 
that has been very critical in uh, women, particularly raising assets uh, to support their families, to support uh, agriculture value system. And um, we would also want to encourage that some of the challenges or some of the challenges we have is that um, of uh, agricultural infrastructure and value chain. Yes, this is thank, you so, thank you yes. so much for that overview. I want to I want to move along because I want to hear uh, from the other speakers, but also because we want to come back to you for some questions. Your presentation was really interesting, and truly, we've had a food system summit here, and you are taking a food systems approach in Zimbabwe. So we really applaud your work, and I want I know that we're going to have some questions back to you. So if you don't mind, I'm going to move to LV now. Um, but thank you so much, Marriott, for telling us about that approach, and it's it's so interesting. I want to hear more about it. Elvi, um, Elvi will be speaking in Spanish. We'll have a translation. Um, but Elvi is work. You are working in the dry corridor of Central America: El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, where we are we are hearing that farmers are facing the worst crisis uh, because of um, uh, a drought in 35 years. Um, so, Elvi, tell us about the situation in Central America, the link of food, of migration. We know Central America is a, is a place where people migrate from, but also within the region, they, they migrate to, to other countries within the Central America region. Uh, tell us about the pressures you're facing, but also some of the opportunities that you have before, before you. Elvi, over to you. Muchísimas gracias nuevamente a todos y a todas por este espacio. Andrés, su esposa Carmen y sus tres hijos sembraban maíz en Honduras, país que los vio nacer. La siembra no solo les daba el sustento, sino que tenían con ella una profunda conexión existencial. La tierra era parte de ellos y ellos parte de la tierra que cultivaban. Pero una sequía prolongada azotó la región y la tierra dejó de parir el maíz. Ya no pudieron seguir vendiendo el fruto de la tierra y de su trabajo. Ni siquiera producían lo mínimo para consumir. Pronto llegó el hambre y la desesperación obligó a esta familia centroamericana como a otras miles a tomar la decisión más dolorosa de su vida. Abandonar su tierra, sus raíces y lanzarse a las peligrosas rutas migratorias con el sueño de llegar a Estados Unidos a conquistar el derecho a vivir con dignidad. Llevaron consigo tan solo unas pocas pertenencias, recuerdos y fragmentos de su cultura y de su tradición. Al igual que Andrés y su familia, millones de latinoamericanos y latinoamericanas se han visto duramente golpeados por una crisis socioambiental que ha traído como consecuencia graves violaciones a los derechos humanos, entre ellos el derecho a la vida, a la alimentación, a un suministro adecuado de agua potable, a una vivienda digna, y a la salud. En América Latina son las comunidades pobres y vulnerables quienes sufren de manera desproporcionada las consecuencias de la crisis ecológica y climática. Paradójicamente, también son los más inocentes los que menos han contribuido a causar el problema en su origen. Según las orientaciones de la sección de migrantes y refugiados de la Santa Sede sobre desplazados climáticos, la cual compartimos con, totalmente en Cáritas de América Latina y el Caribe, se trata de una cuestión de naturaleza profundamente moral que exige una justicia ecológica e incluso una justicia intergeneracional. En todos los países del continente, las consecuencias de un modelo basado en la depredación de la casa común y la explotación 
del trabajo humano está dejando nefastas consecuencias. Pero en esta oportunidad quiero poner la mirada de manera particular en las consecuencias de este sistema que, como ha dicho el Papa Francisco, mata en el llamado corredor seco centroamericano y su relación con la migración forzada. Pues la subregión que integran Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador y Nicaragua ocupa las primeras posiciones en el mundo en el índice de riesgo climático. La migración forzada siempre ha sido uno de los signos característicos de la realidad en Centroamérica y México. Sin embargo, en los últimos años hemos visto y acompañamos en nuestro servicio pastoral como Cáritas las llamadas caravanas de migrantes, que son colectivos humanos que desde Centroamérica intentan cruzar México con destino a Estados Unidos en condiciones de gran vulnerabilidad, con frecuencia víctimas de la violencia de los cuerpos policiales, de los grupos armados e ilegales y de las redes de trata y tráfico humano. Pero... ¿Por qué tantos hermanos y hermanas de esa región se ven obligados a migrar? Según datos de la FAE, en el corredor seco, como consecuencia del cambio climático y el calentamiento global, el 80% de los hogares, 8 de cada 10 hogares que dependen de la producción de granos básicos, vive por debajo del umbral de la pobreza y un 30% de ellos vive en situación de pobreza extrema. La pobreza sigue siendo el principal expulsor de migrantes en nuestra región. Un grave problema asociado es la pérdida de empleos en los sectores agrícola, ganadero, forestal y, peste y pesquero, como consecuencias de temas relacionados con el clima, el calentamiento global, el cambio climático. Otra lacerante realidad del mercado de trabajo en el corredor seco centroamericano es la subocupación, que exige a millones de personas trabajar más de ocho horas al día, de lunes a domingo, por menos del salario mínimo sin ningún tipo de seguridad social. Son nuevas formas de esclavitud y servidumbres que también obligan a estos hermanos y hermanas a buscar nuevos horizontes, a huir de su tierra en búsqueda de una oportunidad para vivir mejor. Del mismo modo, se han incrementado en Centroamérica, en la región del Corredor Seco, los conflictos sociales por disputa de fuentes de agua. Nunca pensamos en el continente que el agua se iba a convertir en una fuente de conflictos en las comunidades, creando inseguridad e indicios de que este problema latente va a alcanzar grandes dimensiones en el campo social. Dentro del ámbito de la movilidad humana, la migración laboral se convierte en una estrategia de resiliencia y adaptabilidad climática que contribuye con el desarrollo de los países de destino, pero también con los países de origen de los migrantes por medio de la generación de remesas. A pesar de la gravedad de esta problemática, Centroamérica solo recibe el 0.7% de los fondos aprobados a nivel mundial para adaptarse o contribuir a mitigar el cambio climático. Esta baja inversión es, por supuesto, un factor que sigue profundizando las causas que generan la movilidad forzada relacionada con el clima, con los temas ecológicos. Las Cáritas de América Latina y todas las organizaciones que conformamos la Red Clamor estamos comprometidos a, como nos invitó el Papa Francisco, a acoger, proteger, promover e integrar a las personas en migración forzada, desplazamiento interno, refugio y tratas de personas. Por eso, subrayamos la necesidad de apuntar a las causas que generan la movilidad forzada, 
a transformar las estructuras que empobrecen y excluyen a las grandes mayorías y que aceleran la crisis climática. En la región estamos realizando diversos proyectos que buscan empoderar a las comunidades, especialmente a las comunidades campesinas e indígenas, en procesos de producción agrosustentables, en economía solidaria, emprendimientos familiares, gestión de modos de vida, donde el campesino, el indígena, donde el centroamericano se convierte en sujeto protagonista de su propio desarrollo. A pesar de las devastadoras consecuencias del mal manejo que hemos hecho de la tierra, de los ríos, de los árboles, a pesar de la pérdida de biodiversidad, seguimos empeñados en acompañar a las comunidades a gestar un modelo de desarrollo integral, humano y sustentable que vaya en equilibrio con la casa común. Una economía con rostro humano, una política centrada en el bien común y una cultura basada en la fraternidad, en la libertad y, por supuesto, en el tejido de redes de acción colectiva que vayan gestando nueva vida para todos. La ayuda humanitaria para nosotros siempre será necesaria, pero no podemos conformarnos con atender solo las consecuencias. Insistimos en la necesidad de apuntar a las causas estructurales que están generando la movilidad forzada, la violencia y el hambre en nuestra región. Para ello exigimos el respeto a los derechos humanos de las personas en movilidad forzada, incluyendo la no devolución, la autodeterminación, la no discriminación y toda la gama de los derechos civiles, políticos, económicos, sociales y culturales de estos hermanos y hermanas nuestras que se ven obligados a migrar. Urge garantizar una migración segura hacia los países de destino, pero también la regularización de los migrantes que están viviendo en países de tránsito o con vocación de permanencia. Debemos derrumbar muros y construir puentes de solidaridad. Tal como lo afirma el Papa Francisco en la Laudato Si, todo está conectado. Y si seguimos depredando la casa común, acelerando los efectos del cambio climático y el calentamiento global, manteniendo estilos de vida, modos de producción y de consumo que favorecen la acumulación escandalosa de los bienes de la creación en pocas manos y la miseria, la exclusión y peor aún, el descarte de las grandes mayorías, continuará creciendo en el corredor seco, en América Latina y en el mundo, la migración forzada y con ella graves violaciones a los derechos humanos. Lamentablemente, la mayoría de los estados en la región están profundizando las llamadas políticas de seguridad nacional, cerrando fronteras, exigiendo visas que son imposibles sí. de tramitar, negando derechos a los migrantes, haciendo deportaciones arbitrarias y alimentando la xenofobia. Tratados internacionales y discursos políticos sobre reconocimiento de derechos y protección a las personas en movilidad forzada suelen quedarse en letra muerta. Yeah, ya, thank you. Ya, gracias. Thank you so much, Alvi. We really appreciate uh, what you're saying, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, we do need we need to hear from everyone on the panel. Um, you're really describing a situation where there are structural injustices and. You know, there's nothing more unjust than food producers. You're, you're, you're talking about food producers who are impoverished and who are food insecure themselves. And what an injustice that is. And we applaud you for looking at the structures, uh, noting that humanitarian work is important, but it will never fix it. We need structural changes. So thank you, LG, for, uh, for, for your work there and reflecting all the, the concerns and opportunities we have in, in, in this in this region, which we, we, we don't want to call the dry corridor. We want this region to be a food producing region with justice. So thank you so much, Elvi. Matthew, now uh, over to you. We have, Matthew works at UNEP as you heard. 
And we wanted to ask you, Matthew, we hear this week we're talking about the global compact and migration. And we know that there's a Paris Agreement and we had a Glasgow Summit on climate. We know that there's the Sendai Agenda uh, for action on disaster risk reduction. Are these at all talk or can these bring action and how can they bring action? Because we've I've had to study up all the treaties that we're, we're following and I participate in some of them and I know uh, our, our, our guests here do too, but tell us, how do you stitch these together and how can we really bring action from these? Matthew, over, over to you. Thank you. I think I have a much more difficult question than the others. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, to start from the easier end, I think that the conceptual synergies are pretty clear, but it's the how to trickle them down at the implementation, which is the more trickier part and, and one where we have to do better. And, and I think it's very clear from the previous, very good, very tangible examples of how if you have more difficult, more intense climatic pressures and, and shocks in the future, it will impact your achievement of SDGs. And then if you don't achieve your SDGs, you're less prepared to face those more difficult uh, climate pressures, so there's a there's a very bad feedback loop, and and human mobility is a is a possible adaptation measure. It's it's something that that can help to manage these situations. Um, but in reality, then we are organized in sectors, and and we have to somehow figure out the um, division of labor or some way to to as you say stitch together these different ideas that, that we, we have and, and for, for scaling up therefore I, I think um, you need to you need both you need the in-depth uh, expertise but then you also need to go beyond it and you need to cross these silos and and um, one of the tools to do that is, is what do we measure and, and treasure and I think our m &E systems are a lot about isolating the problem rather than how do we see it in an integrated way so it would be helpful to, to have improved uh, m and &E, uh, ways in, in, in that sense. Uh, it, it's also institutions that, that the, the data is just fragmented everywhere. Um, but, but somehow we need to find the, the more integrated approaches. And, and one way uh, um, is considering the gender aspects, both in terms of analysis, but also empowering women, because we in Jeanette also have experiences of how that can help to see the, the more holistic perspective. And I don't have time to go into uh, very much detail in, in any detail uh, how that looks like. But what connecting to what has been said previously here about the bottom up, uh, it's also important that, that you do uh, connect this bottom up somehow. And, and you can talk about policy practice group, but when you do have public policies that do come also from these international um, treaties, but you also uh, need some kind of feedback loop from what works and what doesn't and, and you need to be able to build on that and therefore also at the more tangible level that we were hearing about a lot how, how to how do we connect the dots how do we connect these these different disaster reduction and, and um, planet adaptation and, and uh, uh, work with the with, with displacement um, and I would as coming from the climate side I would say that Climate adaptation also provides a lot of the solutions. So if it is a, a, a good cause, it's also where you are able to, to find solutions. Um, and there's been a lot of <clears throat> discussion already. I think it's not, not, not clear, but, but it, there are lots of examples of, of the, the push factors. But I think one thing I wanted to highlight as well is that, and where, where I've been involved a little bit in studying, is the receding areas. Of, of migration and, and human mobility, and in particular, urbanization. It has come up in a couple of contexts that, in my work, which is climate security, peace and security, that is it really about migration or is it actually about urbanization? And how are cities more prepared to this reality where you have the drift migration that we've heard about, the, the migration where your yields are not anymore uh, as good as they used to be, and the youth don't have that perspective? And they come little by little, and then you have these extreme weather events, and you have lots of people come at the same time. How can cities be better prepared? And therefore, thirdly, um, <clears throat> on, on some of those concrete examples, and, and there are obviously much more to, to, to share, but I just 
to give you a couple of um, concrete ways in, in which we are trying to see these both benefits in, in, in the urban uh, areas is just so in order to develop this platform where you can put different things together, we, we are part of, of something called CD Adapt. So you think about the, the urban resilience, uh, but you also think about um, inclusion, you also think about um, participation and, and uh, capacity building and, and climate justice, obviously. And, and when you do nature based solutions, when you work on water infiltration, it doesn't necessarily need to be where you do have the water, but where you do have the, the migrants who do come to the lesser environmentally sound places of, of towns, but you might work on upstream of, of rivers. But anyway, you, you, you know that you are solving a problem downstream. Um, Secondly, um, this climate adaptation, there's obviously funds uh, attached to, to that, and, and um, it's difficult to give an exact figure how much of that trickles down uh, to, to the city level, but, but also we are working on, on integrated approaches where you do consider, for example, this human mobility aspect. And, and finally, I am a big, uh, I have a big interest in, in foresight and how do we because climate change is also about these longer term perspectives and, and these structural issues that, that were mentioned. How do we have um, scenario, inclusive scenario exercises where we do think about the long term, where we use climate scenarios, which is more physical science, but put it together then with more speculative, more, more on, on the social and, and economic and, and uh, even pieces of your side. How do we? Put together what, what potential cascading impacts uh, might be and how that helps us to see what's inevitable, what can public policies address, and, and then have this uh, cross sectoral dialogue about, about the uh, future that can be really much more difficult or can be um, okay. So, in, in conclusion, there are key synergies. It's that the difficulties, how do we? How do we uh, put it in practice um, and, and be climate smart, risk informed, um, and, and thinking of, of those uh, left behind at the, at the same time, how, how this helps to shape the policies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew. Very interesting. And, and it really brings to mind when we look at this urbanization, the, the reason there's often ur urban, rapid urbanization is there's a there's a crisis where they came from. They had to go to the city area because their livelihood, something happened. Or uh, it could be a war, it could be climate change, could be both. So it's really important an issue you're, you're, you're looking at. And we have to think about putting people at the center of these rapid urbanization and what are their livelihoods and how do we put people at the center. Um, Christian. Um, from ACT Alliance is with us. Um, Christian, we need to keep it to a, just a few minutes, if you don't mind, so we could get to the Q&A. But um, we wanted to ask you about, um, you know, we just heard from Mati about the international mechanisms and some of the strategies uh, to have a, a, a bottom-up approach or a grassroots approach. Um, we wanted to ask you, you know, given the weather extremes, the loss of agriculture, what do you think? We're here in New York and we talk to perm reps and important people here. What do you think we, the international community, can do to help people who are forced into migration? What more can be done, um, in, in your opinion? Uh, Christian, over to you. Yes, thanks. And I, I was told I would have five minutes, so prepare to be underwhelmed. Um, <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, speaking on behalf of ACT, obviously, um, a global network of of 140 churches and church-related organizations working uh, across 120 countries. And uh, apart from migration displacement, we also, we've traditionally had a, a strong focus on climate justice and uh, also on gender justice. Um, we're also members of the Global Coalition on Migration, the, the Civil Society Action Committee and the Climate Migration and Displacement Platform where a lot of our sort of analytical thinking on this has been has been uh, germinated. Um, the, the Global Coalition recently came out with a spotlight report on international migration uh, that I encourage you to, to take a look at. And one of the main focus areas in that report uh, is on regularization and regular pathways. 
um, and also on climate change. So I want to talk briefly here about how these how these topics are connected. Um, the adoption of the of the GCM uh, marked a watershed moment not only for the topic of migration being elevated in a more consistent way onto a global multilateral agenda, but also more visibly establishing this connection between the effects of, of climate change and, and the question of human mobility. Um, several of you, uh, including Mati, have talked about other instruments and processes that have already dealt with this connection in the past and that have sort of honed in on specific aspects of it. Um, whether it be disaster risk reduction or adequate need for financing, et cetera. Um, but the, the, the GCM really is, is the first, um, is the first um, framework that sort of takes head on the political issues behind some of this. Um, and so what we've basically seen in the GCM text, and I'm sure you're all familiar, is this division between looking at adverse drivers of migration on the one hand in objective two, and then looking at, at pathways um, in objective five. And by their own admission and uh, as evidenced by, by a recent uh, mapping that was done by the Platform on Disaster Displacement uh, in, the, in the context of the United, Network, United Nations Network on Migration, which will be shared tomorrow, I think, at a side event that certain many of you will be attending, I'm sure. Um, so they found that you know, much more progress has been made by states so far in addressing environmental drivers of migration. Uh, so for example, initiatives to reduce emissions, um, to include migration in DRR efforts, et cetera, uh, than in working on the issue of pathways, meaning you know, we have a lot more to report on under objective two than we do under, under objective five. Uh, this is really not surprising. Um, on the one hand, addressing drivers aligns relatively more easily with existing government policies on, on climate change, on, on DRR. Um, it's not as divisive a, a subject in public policy, uh, generally speaking, although many organizations, including our members on the ground, would probably beg to differ, especially when it comes to uh, questions about enabling participation of affected communities, uh, ensuring gender responsive uh, policies and interventions, all of which are often uh, disregarded, uh, especially in programs that are that are driven more by humanitarian um, prerogatives in a lot of cases. On the other hand, when it comes to migration pathways, um, you may remember much was made during the negotiations for the GCM of this distinction between regular and irregular migration, uh, with states emphasizing the need to enable the former and, uh, and prevent the latter. Uh, what wasn't always mentioned as clearly, but was, was quite, quite clear to migrants always, is the fact that irregularity is willfully and artificially created by states to deter the arrival of unwanted migrants and to keep their numbers manageable despite the fact that this approach makes migrants more vulnerable to rights violations and therefore contravenes one of the central guiding principles of the global compact. Um, to me or to us looking at this, the most central commitment really for improving the right situation of migrants lies in objective five on enhancing the availability and accessibility of regular migration pathways. And yet it remains one of the most underfulfilled objectives of the global compact today. Why is that? Um, I think that some of it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that granting access to territory uh, is still seen as one of the core prerogatives of, of state authorities and expression of, of sovereignty, which continues to be exercised sometimes to the detriment both of those seeking entry and those seeking to protect borders. Um, so, so, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a philosophical question. On the other hand, I do believe that it's been difficult to make progress in this area um, as many states and institutions still attempt and when we, you know, a little bit of that was in your question, but there's still this attempt to make a clear cut distinction between quote unquote forced and voluntary migration. Um, acknowledging that there are some uh, legal responsibilities towards the former, but designating the latter almost entirely as elective migrants who could best protect themselves by just staying at home. 
Um, but we know, of course, from our work that this is not true in practice, and then it's in fact an unhelpful and endangering dangerous distinction to make. Um, human rights violations occur whether you're classified as a refugee or a migrant or whatever the cause of your movement may be. Um, and so the situation of people compelled to move due to the effects of climate change is, is emblematic in this regard, not least because it's usually not climate change alone that causes people to be vulnerable uh, and thus prone to migrate, but rather we see sort of a deepening and intens intensifying uh, of existing inequalities. And uh, the, there are lives, there are those whose lives and livelihoods have already been massively impacted by climate change and who may even be forced to relocate in the not too distant future. There's a whole other discussion around that. Uh, many others have been facing tough circumstances and have had to supplement family income with occasional cross border work. Uh, others still may have gone ab abroad for a period of time with the intention to return only to realize that the basis of their livelihood has continued to erode. So they may need to extend their stay, change their status, or be allowed to leave and return, depending on their situation. Um, all of them would benefit from more holistic and flexible approach by states to the question of regular pathways. So they're not forced into situations where their options are diminishing and they may end up without status, without protection and, and without hope. So there are tools then in the GCM uh, and indeed in other instruments that can that can be used um, um, to to make this uh, more accessible for people who need it. Um, and you know, I'll just mention a few labor mobility agreements. Um, there are free movement regimes, such as in the EU, famously in, in West Africa and in parts of Latin America. Um, there are um, um, there are also practices for admission and stay. Uh, to address vulnerabilities in migration based on compassionate humanitarian and other considerations that can uh, complement other tools and help close protection gaps. There's a guidance note that came out last year um, with the, where we collaborated with the UN network uh, uh, on migration to give guidance to states on how, how they can strengthen exactly these kinds of tools. Um, and we hope that this will lead to more consistent adoption of these practices. Um, there have been related initiatives taken, especially at national and regional level, uh, to address humanitarian crisis, um, for example, that are uh, reflected in other instruments, as I said, mostly, uh, or most importantly, perhaps the Global Compact on Refugees, uh, which is not talked about much anymore these days, but which also promotes the elaboration of complementary pathways, as they're called there. And, and the lessons from that should be applied and reflected in the context of GCM implementation as well. Uh, our concern is to just to make sure that the implementation of both compacts upholds uh, coherently and consistently human rights, refugee rights and migrants rights, and that no one person is excluded from additional protections and opportunities just because uh, there's, there's a, a meaningless distinction of categories or poor institutional awareness and communication. So you can see from this how the climate crisis is sort of creating groups whose needs are at the same time very specific, um, but they're also very common to migrants in general, if you look at it from a human rights perspective. So therefore, for all of them, a human rights based approach to regular pathways to overcome the current hesitancy of states to move in that direction is central to preserving their dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Very, very interesting. Well, well thought out. And I'm going to go back and listen to that again, because you really laid out some complicated issues very clear, clearly and made those linkages. And really, I think you're saying that a lot of these choices, these are policy choices. And in body politic, we have to encourage certain choices uh, to make a real difference. And I really appreciate um, you simplifying a lot of these complex issues for us. Thank you. Um, next, I want to go to Maria Amparo from Caritas Internationalis from the Vatican City, direct from just arrived yesterday. Um, Amparo, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I have tried just to listen to all the speakers carefully and to bring some recommendations after listening to all of them. And uh, I like very much uh, one sentence. Uh, on migration as a choice, not as a necessity, just to summarize our discussion today. 
on the building breaches and breaking walls, no? And um, as Aloysius uh, said at the beginning, analyzing the interconnection between all the drivers of migration is in fact key to understand the complexity of migration and to develop comprehensive policies at the national level to respond to the most vulnerable. As Aloysius mentioned, this is a matter of social justice. But also at the global level, there is need to enhance the policy coherence across the various policy silos. As we know, there is a variety of relevant fora, as also mentioned today, and processes concerning to climate change and environment, including climate displacement, but they are not always coordinated. And um, today also um, Mati brought one interesting uh, call about the cross-sectoral dialogue as an important call uh, to, to, to strengthen. But this requires the states as well to engage in all those processes in a more coherent way. Um, but also those affected countries lacking technical support, training and financial resources be supported by the international community as well. A strategic coordination at the UN level is certainly needed to better coordinate the different areas of work of the UN agencies, organizations, international organizations, faith-based organizations, so that the protection uh, needs of climate and environmental displays can be addressed uh, in a more comprehensive and holistic way. And um, we heard uh, Christian uh, bringing an important example uh, on the interconnectivity about the global compact on migration and the global compact on refugees that we all know that this is about the global compact on migration. But we as faith-based organizations, we also know that many people can't and usually do fit into many categories at the same time and sometimes may fall into no category perfectly. So it's important to ensure this, this um, coherence. And um, bringing migration as a, so, as a choice and not as a necessity um, means, as brought by Caritas Zimbabwe, uh, creating conditions that allow rural people to stay where they live if they, if they want to stay, and building this resilience of the communities, of the displaced communities as the key elements of a global response to the migration challenge. Um, Paul mentioned the, the Food System Summit where Caritas Internationales, along with other faith-based organizations, brought the call on the smallholder farmers to the scenario, the importance of the family farming, agroecology, in the indigenous knowledge. And we listen today, the need to strengthen this further, to protect this uh, smallholder agriculture in order to guarantee the human rights of the local communities. So agroecology, also we heard about climate adaptation, should receive more funds from the international community. So this resilience has become urgent and must be addressed through preparedness, training as highlighted also by Carita Zimbabwe through the different initiatives, but also many, many other projects from uh, Caritas in the world, from other faith-based organizations, at Alliance, the different churches around, and, and through the different initiatives they are undertaking, capacity building. As well as, in, as well as on investing in uh, long-term resilience strategies. Uh, we also heard about the um, regular channels for migration today, as highlighted by Christian. And if we are speaking about reducing the vulnerability of environmental migrants and displaced people, um, it's important not only to develop because we know there is already a commitment around the global compact on migration objective five around this um, regular channels, but it's important that those channels are strengthened, that those channels are accessible and respectful of fundamental rights implemented in a coordinate, in a coherent and predictable manner and accompanied by concrete measures. So uh, this can take the forms also we heard today, the form of uh, visas, humanitarian work, or study, humanitarian corridors established through partnership with civil society organizations for most vulnerable migrants, um, visa waivers for a specific population or family reunification. 
and family, we are fam a family. And finally, um, it's, it's, it's important um, to, to commit as a recommendation to, to enhance the legal uh, protection of displaced people. Um, I want also, uh, as, as we heard the different experiences from Red Clamor, from um, Caritas Zimbabwe, we didn't hear today other experiences, but there are many where uh, all of them, they tell us that the voices and experiences of climate and environmental displaced should be more heard. And the knowledge and insight should inform policy making. So states and local policies should promote the empowerment of women that we hear today, including displaced women, youth, local communities, through access to resources, education, technologies that we didn't hear today here, but at the, at the, at the meeting, at the panel, the main panel today uh, at the UN, and other activities for sustainable development, mitigation and adaptation to climate change, as we also heard, and sustainable use of natural resources. So as we uh, heard today, let's keep working on bridging uh, bridges and breaking walls in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wrap up. And I want to thank Carrie Pass and the Nationalists, uh, the Secretary General, kicking off this session and really highlighting uh, bringing all these voices together. I want to thank Brianna. She's been working here. She's new to the NGO community here in New York, and we welcome her. Um, we just I just met her a couple couple months ago, and it's great to have have a new face on the NGO groups here. And uh, everyone who's here and online, we thank you for joining, and we thank all the the co-sponsors and the panelists: Marius, Elvi, Matei, Mati, Christian, Ampar. Thank you.